and share the screen. In the bag. Where's the bag? Right where's the bag? Right where's the bag? Right where's the bag? Okay, is that you see that? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I actually um uh kind of a, a full disclosure th this week what I ended up doing is um there was uh, I was listening to the um Bible Project pro uh, podcast and they had been talking about the family of Christ or the um and, or the family of God and they came to um one of the episodes they were talking about um the nations and there were so many things that the nations the nations and um the the rival nations of israel but um uh, but the 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 kind of stories that you have and the overall picture of the nations uh, in scripture and um and i was going wow this ties in so much of um what i was covering over the last couple of weeks uh i know a lot of you guys uh missed that but i was talking about um the magi a couple of weeks ago and mm -hmm. also about the the mountain of assembly and um there were just themes in there that i, I, was, I was thinking well it really ties in and so it was it was something that i was going to kind of touch on in the future but it was um one of those subjects that kind of uh uh, touched on a lot of things, but really, I um, if you listen to that podcast, I think it was from one or two weeks ago. Um, uh, it's it, this is pretty much like um, where I made an outline of the things they were discussing, look things up, and then kind of filled in some other things, you know. So um, you know, almost plagiarism, but not really. Um, yeah, right. So you know. <laughs> I hate doing something like that and then not saying that I did that, you know. But anyway, um, the enemy brothers of Israel, and um, and here this is a, a painting basically of Jacob and Esau at the time that they were kind of reconciled to each other, um, you know. And, and there's always going to be this rival brother who um, is not the heir to the promise and ends up being an enemy of, the, of Israel. Now, Jacob and Esau, they pretty much made friends again, but their descendants didn't. And there were there were problems there. So um, here, Angie's here. Let me let her in. Oh, cool. I can see this now. Uh, Zoom fixed this thing, I, you know, like where if somebody um, was trying to get in, I couldn't see it if I was sharing a screen. Hello, Angie. So... <clears throat> Let's start off with this um, idea. Okay, here's Chris. So, so let's start off with this idea of the 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 seed or the the siblings. And this is kind of a good way to look at you know if you looked at the seed of the woman going all the way to Christ, it's you know you you see that that tree kind of branch out, and then you're going okay, it's is it Cain or is it Abel? But it's not Cain or Abel. Um, because, you know, you have that problem where Abel's dead now, and in the, the mind of the reader, you're thinking, well, that, that seed of the woman that's going to rescue everybody is not going to come from Cain, so who is, who is this, you know, who's the next one going to be, and then she has Seth, and that's why she says, um, I have, um, I have uh, born a, a child, and she, she calls it her seed. God has granted me another seed, and usually you're you're talking about the, the seed of the man. You're not talking about the seed of the woman, right? So it's it's it. You follow that um, that line of Seth, and then you have that um, line of Seth versus Cain, and then you have and that that line of Seth goes down to Noah. And, um, and it's kind of like at that point, it's really Noah and the world, you know, you don't really have this sibling uh, over there per se, but, but you have two, uh, three brothers at the end of that, and you have Shem, um, who ends up being rivals of Ham and Japheth. Ham and Japheth, their um, offspring end up being enemies of Shem. So, and, and you can follow that all the way down from the descendant of Shem. You, you can go all the way down to Abraham. And then you get Abraham versus, versus the other nation and also Lot's descendants. Because even though Lot's, his um, 
nephew. It's it's not like his the you know they they kind of split off. You have this promise to Lot, but Lot actually he has sons, right? Um, you know, after he escapes from Sodom and Gomorrah, um, you know, there's that ugly story where his daughters get him drunk or whatever. But um, from there, you, you have um, Lot's descendants, Moab and Ab Ammon. So the Moabites, they become enemies. The Ammonites, they become em enemies. Then you have Isaac versus Ishmael later on. Um, you have, uh, uh, sorry. You have Isaac versus Ishmael later on. And, you know, again, Ishmael is not the promised son. I, Isaac turns out to be the son of the promise. And Ishmael's descendants, they become enemies of Israel. Uh, Jacob versus Esau. Um, I just mentioned them. Esau, they become enemies of Israel. Um, Judah versus the, his rival brothers, actually. It, ultimately, you get to um, the, the line of David and in there's a split between Israel and Judah. And, um, and so you basically have Judah fighting his brothers. And you, so you have the story of these uh, sibling rivalries. And that's really what, if you look at all the, the fights in the judges and in, uh, um, in Joshua and in the Kings, um, Samuel, those chronicles, those are all fights um, with um, brother countries, you could say, you know. So, yeah, I'm sorry. David's children. Yeah, yeah. David's children, they're fighting each other. That that one's not really followed into like um, the nations or anything. Um, but you, when you look at the names of the nations and you see the names um, uh, and you look at the names of the early people, they're always brothers of um they're somehow connected with Israel or they're, they're, they're other sounds of Abraham or something else like that. So the point here is that the unchosen, you know, the, the ones that didn't get chosen in that line, they proved to be hostile. Um, but at the same time, the, cho the chosen do not pr prove to be more morally ethical than the ones that weren't chosen. In other words, if you look at the lives of, say, Abraham and especially Jacob or something like that, they're not they're not really morally superior. And you, and you get that, you get this really quick um, sort of study in, in scripture that, wait a minute, Abraham lies, but God's defending Abraham, even though this king of Egypt really didn't do anything wrong and is acting fairly innocently. And, and you find that what God is doing is that he's chosen Abraham because he chose Abraham. It wasn't like, hey, I think that you're a nicer guy than any of these other guys. I'm going to choose. No, he just he chooses Abraham. Right. It's a, it's a sovereign choice. And so um, and he's going to defend Abraham because of his promise to Abraham. It's not really based on Abraham's merit. You know, exactly. So the question becomes, is election due to righteousness? And the story about the elect is really, um, it's not really the, the story of the ethical versus unethical. God defends Abraham because of his covenant to him, not because what he does is right. And we see the same thing repeated, for example, with um, Jacob. We, we see it with David. Um, David does a lot of things that just aren't right. We even see we even see Israel in a bad light later on. And we talked about some of these things. When we, when we studied Jonah, we saw that you had, even though Jonah was called by God, you think, boy, he's one of the elect. He's called by God. He's a prophet. He's got the whole, he's got the whole, um, you know, uh, package, right? On, on, one, on that end of things. But you look at the people that are really obedient and really start serving God. They're the total Gentiles. They're the people on the ship. Who, um, who actually honor God. And there are the people in Nineveh who um, repent, even though that later on we see that Israel is completely unrepentant. So you have sort of this, um, uh, you have this, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, an indictment on, on Israel. We see this with the Magi too. You know, the, you have in the middle of Israel, you have the, the, the king who was born, 
none of them, you know, it's, it's the leadership is completely asleep to this idea. And then you have Magi from far away. They're sorcerers. These, these are sorcerers from a foreign country and they come and show up and they go, something's up and we want to worship this king, born, born king, king of the Jews, right? So throughout the narrative, the non-elect are periodically highlighted as the good actors. Um, in fact, quite a few times. And whenever they're mentioned, usually this is the pattern, is that their ethnicity is mentioned as well. Because the writer wants you to know and wants you to put two and two together to go, wait a minute, they're a Canite, they're a such and such, they're a such and such, where have I heard that name again? So that you can go back into Genesis or wherever you see these lineages and you go, oh, they're actually a brother of Israel, right? Um, and, and they're also uh, an enemy of Israel. It, it kind of, so when you see these um, lineages, a lot of times you, you just want to like uh, overlook the, you know, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, et cetera. And you're just like, well, I skip all over all of those parts. But once you start paying attention to the names and you go, wait, where have I heard that name before? It starts becoming really, really interesting. So whenever, um, when you see their ethnicity, you can go back and see how they're related to Israel. And so this is a story about sibling rivalry with the inclusion of nations as the brothers of Israel as both the bad guys on one hand, but also the good guys. So Israel is really in the end a vehicle um, to bless and re-inherit the nations. So when I say re-inherit, um, it's, it's when, um, you know, at that, it's because of the disinheriting of the nations um, after the Tower of Babel. So um, there's a deeper meaning to it than, um, you know, that, that they, they just don't have God's inheritance, but he is going to include them in, in the end. So <clears throat> Abraham is the father of many nations. Let me make sure. So originally God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation. That's what you have when he first gets called out and, and all that, and he gets separated. You're going to be the father of a great nation, and I'm going to build a nation through you, right? And then, but he does promises, promise him that through that nation or through that seed, that all the families of the earth would be blessed. But later on, that gets expanded because what, he, what happens is that in the meantime, he has Ishmael, and he's hoping that Ishmael is going to be the one who's going to be the heir and is going to, uh, God's going to build the nation through, right? But God tells him, no, it's not going to be through Ishmael. And even though you love Ishmael, um, it's not going to happen through him. It's not who I've chosen. So who he has chosen is um, Isaac. And so here he tells them, though, that um, this is in Genesis 17, that after Ishmael, you know, had been born and everything, that God is stressing that Ishmael is not the chosen one. He tells Abraham he would be the father of many nations. So now he's saying, you're going to be the father of um, not just a nation that's going to be a blessing to many nations. You're actually going to be the father of many nations. Many nations are going to um, come from you. So um, what he's doing here really is that he's using Abraham's folly because Ishmael is really the product of him abusing a servant woman and them, him and Sarah uh, basically oppressing her and then, and then you, know, you know, making it up in their own mind what they want to do. It's basically the taking of the fruit where you've decided that you're just going to do, um, you're going to call the shots and you're going to decide the, the knowledge of good and evil, right? Um, and then, yeah, big surprise there, you know, how that ended up. So, but God takes these um, sins or he takes these um, unwise decisions, but he, but he knows what, what's going to happen anyway. So he takes that and he turns um, evil into good, or he takes an imperfect situation and he, and he uses that. So now Abraham's the father of many nations and Abraham's going to be a seed. His seed is going to be a blessing to all nations. Thus, this has always been the plan for Yahweh to reclaim the nations that he disinherited after the Tower of Babel when he divided them up according to the numbers uh, of the sons of God. In Deuteronomy 32, 
again, if you read it, uh, and depending on the translation, it says that when God um, divided the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God, which are the, the, the heavenly council at the time, are, and um, they became the gods of the nations. And so, um, but, but it says there that, but um, Israel, he, he has kept as his own inheritance. So the other nations were not his inheritance. He decided he was going to take Abraham. So that's why you have like right at the, on the heels of the Bab Babel story that you have a Abraham who is going to um, be the nation that God is going to um, build his um, inheritance from. So Abraham, let's go to Genesis 25, one through six. Now, I, and I know that like uh, most of you are, you know, very familiar with the stories of Jacob and Esau, Isaac, Ishmael. And so this is why I want to bring up uh, Genesis 25, one through six, because Abraham, after Sarah dies, he marries again, right? So, uh, and he has more children. Now, check out the names here. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian. Does that sound familiar? The Midianites? Ishbak, Shual, Jokshan. Uh, Jokshan uh, fathered Sheba, Sheba and Dedan. Sheba and Dedan, um, I, I'm very familiar with because of Ezekiel 38 and 39, those wars, right? You have Sheba and Dedan, these surrounding nations. And uh, uh, the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Latuthshim, and Leumim. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Epher, Hanok, Abida, and Elda. All these were the children of Keturah. So Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but the, to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son, Isaac, eastward to the east country. That's important right here. Remember our word here to the east. Adam and Eve get expelled out of the garden towards the east. They end up going to ba Babel in the east. Whenever you, so it's it's really the the land of exile. It's also sort of the land out of the presence of God, out of the um, the the protection of God, or you know towards Babylon, um, away from God's country, so to speak. So He sends them away, and they go to the east. If you skip down to um, twenty five seven eleven, it says these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, one hundred and seventy five years. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave at Machpelah, in the fields of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. Now check this out. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Beer Lai Roy. Beer Lai Roy is where a Hagar um, went and uh, where she, when she was kicked out, right? So her, when she was in exile um, and she ran away from, um, you know, um, Sarah, basically, that's the place we went to. So interestingly here, you have Isaac um, living in the place where his um, his estranged brother is is um, is blessed, um, so it makes that connection there for you. Now these are the generations of Israel. Israel. So skipping down to verse twelve, Abraham's son, who Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the birth, uh, the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Israel. Kedar, Abdil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tema, Jeter, Nefesh, and Kadema. <clears throat> these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their encampments. Twelve princes, I, I like that, twelve princes according to their tribes. Just like you had twelve tribes of Israel, you had twelve princes coming from Ishmael. These are the years of their, the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt. So again, 
these guys, they settle in the east. So, um, you know, I have to show you on a map, but again, these guys go eastward um, in the direction of Assyria. He settled, and of course, Assyria, that becomes, um, uh, you know, uh, another big enemy of, um, uh, uh, you know, they, it's, it's Assyria as a land of exile for the Israelites, right? He settled over against all his kinsmen. So here's a sample of the rival brothers. So the Cain, he has um, the Kenites. Now I put a question mark here because there's a bit of controversy just because you're thinking, wait a minute, Cain would have been wiped out in the flood, right? Or his, the Kenites. But the thing is that in Hebrew, um, the root word for Cain, it's, it, it reads more like Cainites. Um, it's the same sort of a uh, um, root word, right? And so some people think, well, it must mean something else, but usually scripture is pretty um, consistent in um, telling you where somebody's from, but also giving you, uh, letting you know what the story was or where they came from. So that one, I just put a question mark, okay? And Cain and the Cainites. Um, Ham, which, you know, we learned a lot about Ham with the Canaanites, Egyptians and Babylonians all came from Ham. Um, also all of the giant clans, all of the, you know, um, Rephaim and Anakim and, um, and the, you know, the giants in the land of Canaan. Um, Lot, um, his nephew, which are Moabites and Ammonites, and then Esau, which are the Edomites. So here's a sample of some of the non-chosen families um, and their heroes, okay, heroes in the Bible. First of all, we have Jethro. He's the priest of Midian. So he is um, Moses's father-in-law. Um, Moses, remember, he runs off to Egypt and he marries uh, a Midian. Uh, uh, he goes, runs off to the land of Midian and he marries um, over there. And her father is... Uh, um, He's the, he's the priest of media, but in other places, he's also referred to as a Canite, which is like, so does he come from Cain? Um, and he basically saves Moses and or helps Moses out by giving him wisdom in Exodus 18. He basically gives him the, um, he's the father of delegation. yeah, he's the, the father of delegation. He goes, Moses, you're wearing yourself out. You need to delegate. This is how you do it. You need to organize and it, basically the way that um, uh, things were delegated and organized was because of Moses' father-in-law, who's not even Jewish, right? And he's also recorded as praising the God of Israel when he hears about the Exodus. Um, so he ends up um, actually worshiping Yahweh. We also have a story of Jael. I like this story because I like violent stories for some reason, but um, she's a canine. Well, you know, as long as it's a, it's a good violent story, right? Like uh, what happens is there's a, um, during the judges, you have Deborah and she tells this one commander, basically, you know, like um, just basically tells him because you're kind of being a chicken, um, you'll, you know, we're going to, you're going to win and everything, but the glory of killing this other king, it's not going to go to you. It's actually going to go to a woman, which in that culture was almost like, it was basically an insult, right? Well, what happens is that um, they are defeating that king and she runs into this tent of this uh, Kenite woman named Jael. And, um, and she kind of goes, oh, here, take some milk, gives him more milk and, and you know, just kind of talks him to sleep. He's really worn out. And when he's asleep, he takes, she takes a tent peg and she nails his head to the floor, you know? So, um, and really the more, you, if, you, if you get into the story, you actually start seeing that, um, that there is a, um, there's a typology here where um, basically you have the savior of Israel crushing the head of the enemy, right? And she actually, um, you have Jael not only helping and being a hero, but she actually starts playing, she, she plays that, that, um, that, that type, that role of, of being, you know, crushing the serpent's heads, right? Exactly. So the savior of Israel crushes the head of a descendant of Ham. And that's, you can find that in Judges 4. Ruth. Ruth is a Moabite. And Ruth, so she's a descendant from Lot. Um, 
And she becomes the great grandmother of David and is part of the messianic li uh, lineage. So she becomes, she becomes a, a descendant of, uh, of Jesus himself, you know? So, and she's a, she's a Moabitess. She actually abandons her gods and um, she goes back to Israel with her mother-in-law says, your people are going to be my people and my God will be your God. Uh, your God will be my God. And that's what I've decided to do. So she leaves her nations, not only her nation, but of course her nation's God. That's kind of like what you did, right? And um, she went to Israel and, and adopted the, the God of the Israelites. Um, Caleb. Caleb is a Kenizzite. Um, so Kenaz, he's a grandson of Esau. So he's an Edomite, basically. And Caleb is one of the, um, he's the only guy besides Joshua, when they go spying in the, in the land before they go conquer it, who isn't chicken about it and, and says, you know, like, no, we can do this. You know, yeah, but we see the giants in the land and we see, you know, everybody else is saying, you know, they're going to eat us up and we look like ants to them and uh, uh, we're nothing, you know, how are we going to do this? And Joshua and Caleb, they're, they're like, no, God, God's with us and we can do this. Kenizzite. Caleb, um, Caleb is a Kenizzite. I didn't put down the verse. Um, yeah, I'd have to look that up afterwards if we remember at the end. Um, so the reclaimed nations of Isaiah. In Isaiah, Isaiah starts having this vision of the Messiah and other things, but he also starts envisioning um, are, are having visions of these nations coming back, okay? So Isaiah's in this period when Assyria is basically attacking, and these are the sons of Ham. Um, I, Assyria are the sons of Ham. So it's another rival brother nation. They're attacking Israel and Judah, and he also sees the, um, starts having visions of the attacks of, of Babylon. He starts um, seeing that on the horizon. And in a sense, um, this is sibling rivalry, rivalry, right? But the city and the hill, what he starts seeing and prophesying about is that the city and the hill of Jerusalem, of Israel, so, of, so the city and the hill of one family will rise above all the other cities and hills, and it will become the source of divine peace and justice, not just for Israel, but for all nations. So then the God of Israel will be the God of all nations. And here's what I'm talking about. Isaiah, this is really early on in Isaiah, Isaiah 2, 1 through 4. It says, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. For those of you who've been here, were like here last year, uh, last week, um, you would recognize the mountain language there. So the this, this is the Mount of Assembly. It's also remember, you know, you have um, Eden on a mountain, and now uh, you know Israel's going to be on a mountain. All of that's going to be um, God's mountain, okay? And where it gets lifted above all the other mountains, okay? Um, so it'd be lifted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. All the nations are going to flow to this mountain. And many people shall come say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore so this is um a vision of the new heavens and the new earth um basically the 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 peace that's going to come you know the um the lion sleeping uh you know the lion and the lamb together and the the baby playing with the serpent and uh, and all those Thing. So it's kind of a, the, the world becoming full of God's wisdom. But here you see that the nations are going to this high mountain. As I, so here's kind of if, just to kind of summarize Isaiah, um, 
as if Isaiah continues, you'll find that this city is going to be ruled by a shoot from the line of David. So when you, you know that like Yahweh is going to judge between those nations and settle disputes and all that, you, you start finding out that it's Israel, it's also Yahweh, but it's also this character from the line of David, this shoot or this branch. Um, you remember that a shoot is going to uh, come out of the stump of Jesse, which is David's father, basically, and he's going to be the king, right? Now that shoot or that branch or seed is going to call the house of Jacob to follow him. He's going to say, here I am, come follow me because I'm here, right? But they won't do it. And this is what I, Isaiah sees. In fact, they're going to be hostile to their own brother and they're going to want to kill him. This is the, these are the suffering servant um, passages in Isaiah. Now the suffering servant is going to give up his life for the sins of many, but, and he's actually going to die, but God's going to vindicate him by showing him the light after the grave. So that's, um, you can read Isaiah 53. So the future of this seed and the future of the city on a hill become two sides of the same coin. So if you're talking about the, the, the Messiah suffering servant character and his future, you find out that this is also Israel's future, right? And it starts blurring the, the, the lines between whether that passage is sometimes talking about the Messiah or if it's talking about Israel um, or if it's talking about the future of the Messiah or if it's talking about the future of Israel. So the way that um, the Jews usually used to see, you know, those passages of the suffering servant is they would see it as um, a personification of Israel being the suffering servant. But if you took all of that as one path, you know, if you put all your eggs in that basket, you go like, well, sometimes the language break down and you go, wait a minute, it can't just be talking about Israel, it's talking about a, a particular individual, right? And if you put all your eggs in that basket, you're going, um, maybe it's not talking about an individual, maybe it's talking about Israel, right? So it's, it's one of those, it's one of those um, things that you see in prophecy where it's blurring the lines between two things because it's trying to merge them, right? Um, so the lines become blurred between Israel and, and the Messiah at times. And this is a passage that's kind of, that, that has a little bit of that, but you're going to see this, um, uh, and, and I'm going to tie this to um, what we talked about with the Magi a couple of weeks ago. So it says, arise, think of the, if, if you're here a couple of weeks ago, think of the, the language in this, okay, with the lights and the rising of the star, you know. Um, also, one of the old magus, magi, a magus or sorcerer who was, um, what's his name, um, uh, Balaam, you know, he actually prophesies, um, uh, you know, of, you know, a star would arise out, you know, out of the uh, Israel and all those, those kinds of things. So arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, the thick darkness, um, the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. I think this is the kings to the brightness of your rising. That's probably one of the reasons why the Magi were conflated with kings, okay? Um, because... Uh, uh, the Magi were not kings, and, I, and it kind of used to baffle me why they call the Magi kings, but probably old scholars used to look at this passage right here and go, this sounds very much like the Magi passage, you know, and, and so they, they kind of called them kings, I think, just to kind of highlight that connection, right? Mm -hmm. So, nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Now, here it's talking about them returning from exile. When you go to the Matthew passage with the, Mag with the Magi, you're like, that's not happening. 
So you have this already but not yet vision in, in Matthew. Matthew is saying basically that you have the nations are responding, parts, parts of the Magi are responding and you know, whether you think of them as kings or sorcerers or whatever else, they, they're, they're, they're coming in and they're, they're paying heed to this king, but Israel's asleep. So they're still in exile. Mm. And then you have that exile of um, uh, Jesus having to escape um, out of the region. And where does he go? He goes to a land of exile, Egypt. It's the other way around. So, um, you know, then, then, of course, Matthew says, you know, and quotes, out of Egypt, I will call, you know, I will call my son, but he's not referring to Egypt as being Egypt. He's calling, he's calling um, Judea, he's calling Israel as being Egypt. They're in exile, and they're asleep. So, so here's where, so here's where you get kind of a clearer picture, because you look at this Isaiah passage, and you, and you see that um, the full picture is not really there yet, Okay. But there, it will come to pass. So it says, lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. I like that picture, you know, uh, little kids being carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. You shall see and be radiant. So you're going to be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because of the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, here are these names again, and those from Sheba. Uh, um, all of these were, are the sons of Keturah, by the way. These Midian, Ephah, and Sheba are all sons of Keturah. That was Abraham's last wife, right? They shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense. Where have we heard that before? All right, and shall bring good news. Now, here's a trick question. What's missing? The myrrh. Why is the myrrh missing? Right, right. Remember, gold was for um, him being royalty and kingship, right? Frankincense is something that you used in temple worship and, and, and it was connected to worship and deity. Mm -hmm. But myrrh was connected to embalming somebody after their death. So when uh, when uh, Matthew is pointing out that they're also bringing myrrh, he's kind of like saying, he's saying this is like this passage in Isaiah. Only you've got um, embalming products with them, you know, fit for a king. But um, but what's going on? It's it's kind of like no. He's saying this is going to be the suffering servant. It's, uh, so he's using Isaiah 60, but he's also saying Isaiah 60 is not here yet, okay? But you already see, and all, you, this is already or not, and not yet, and already and not yet is one of those themes that comes over and over in the Bible. Uh, Acts chapter 2 is already not yet, you know, yeah. Now you see like through a milky glass. Yeah. Then you will see clearly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a foreshadowing. It's a foreshadowing, right? It will be. It's a foreshadowing, but it's also contrast. So to kind of show you, this is like this, but it's also opposite of this because it's not there yet. Yep. It's already, but not yet. That's the way that you can start understanding prophecy already, but not yet. So this, uh, and, and I love these kinds of themes because it, Daniel and Revelation uh, have been so confusing to me for so long because you're, you're, you're always trying to nail something to a time and you're going, and you know, like I took just a futuristic approach, right? And then um, other people are going, wait, this already all happened. The fall of Jerusalem, AD 70, this is, this all, this is historic. And you're going, yeah, it's already, but not yet. It's both. And, and once you start seeing that it's both, you can start thinking about these things. Uh, it, it, yeah, the right way. And you're going, oh, wait a minute. It's already, but not yet. You, you start getting it, I think, at that point. Mm -hmm. So Isaiah 67 through 12 says, all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you, the rams of Nebaioth. These are sons of Ishmael shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar and I will beautify my beautiful house. 
who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves in the windows? So and mentions here, Tarshish is going to come. And, uh, Tarshish, remember that that appears in the story of Jonah. He's trying to go to the furthest place he can think of, right? And this is also Tarshish um, where Paul wants to go because Paul's thinking that if he's going to bring the message to the Gentiles, that the, the, his ultimate destination is going to be in Tarshish. So he, when he writes um, letters from Rome, he, uh, he, well, he says, I'm, or he, he writes a letter, I'm going to go to Rome on my way to Tarshish, you know, so he, in Paul's mind, he's going to reach the Gentiles in the far reaches of Tarshish. That's what, um, so keep Tarshish in mind. Um, Foreigners shall build up your walls, their king shall minister to you. Um, and, um, and oh, check this out in verse 11. Just put this in your back pocket. Your gate shall be open continually day and night. They shall not be shut that people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. That's going to tie it to here to Revelation 21. Because I'm going to go skip over the next week. I'm going to um, cover a little bit more about what Jesus and the um, New Testament writers start seeing with the nations coming in, right? Because we have this whole second chapter of Acts to really look at, and those are going to reflect the nations of um, that were split up in Babylon and those sorts of things. But Revelation kind of gives you um, the end of the story, right? But it, it reflects back in Isaiah uh, chapter 60, again, here. Um, verse 9, it says, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. What he's talking about here is the new Jerusalem. Okay, this is the new Jerusalem coming from heaven um, to earth um, and the new heavens and the earth, new earth. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. There's that mountain again, okay? A great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down of, out of heaven from God. If you skip over to um, verse 23, it says, because it first describes the city um, in between that time. It's made out of all these materials. It's got all these gates, 12 gates and the foundations and, and all that kind of stuff. And it says, the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of uh, God gives it light. So there's that light theme. This is the, the same language Jesus is using when he's saying, you're a city on the hill. Um, you know, he's talking about the mountain, the high place. Um, and he's telling that on the, on the Sermon on the Mount, right? He's like, he, he's bringing them to a mountain so that they can feel that experience. This is my mountain assembly. And, um, and this is Jerusalem, you are the light of the world, those sorts of things. So by its light will the nations walk. There you go, the nations again. By its light, the nations walk. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Sounds just like Isaiah 60. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there, just like we saw Isaiah 60. Open gates, right? Um, they will bring into... It the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean, unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And finally, last chapter of the Bible in verses one and two, it says, then the angel showed me the river of the water of light, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now this brings you all the way back to the garden of Eden, we're on a mountain where God's presence was. Originally, you had the rivers flowing from the top, right? And it was the, the Nile, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Nile, the, um, what was it, the Euphrates and um, uh, Tigris and um, uh, there's one that's closer to Israel, I forget right now but anyway um so now you have that but now instead you have the, the river of the water of life and this is also it goes to what ezekiel sees he sees this river flowing from the temple of god on the high mountain going downwards through the middle of the street of the city also on either side of the river the tree of life 
So we have the tree of life finally again, just like in Genesis, with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And that's, uh, that's it. So um, you basically have, um, uh, you know, kind of like a, um, a you know, the 30,000 foot view of the nations. It's, we, we think so much more individualistically now here in the West, you know, we think, um, uh, we don't think of family and nations. We're not as concerned about lineages and those sorts of things. Um, and, but I, but even our theology is a lot more, um, leans a lot more individualistic. This is between me and God or, you know, um, but we don't think of, you know, families and gods of the nations and our nation's God and, and those sort of sorts of things anyway. Um, but, um, but you're going to see um, that Jesus is, if, if you can think like that, you know, and you can think of like, wow, those nations and that God actually um, cares about them. So if you, if you went back to those days, you would kind of have an environment where um, people thought in terms of our gods, we serve our gods, first of all, but also our stories are all about how we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. And it's really just kind of all about us, right? Whereas scripture, again, takes that and goes, God chose Israel, but he, in the end, he does it because he's gathering the nations back to him. So again, it's, it's like, um, it's those cultural norms and stories and stuff from the ancient world, which are taken the scripture and they're, they're always like turned on its head again. You know, it's, um, you know, you think of the world this way, I'm thinking about it this way. You think of those nations as all like those guys, but the story of scripture is like, no, you're all brothers. And, um, and, and yeah, and they're the, and yeah, yeah. And, um, and so it's, it's like, not only are the, the Gentiles included, but they are, um, they're, they're key, you know, this is why God's doing this. Yeah. 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 What, you know, exactly. He always lifted them up again. Yeah, so she is, she's a she's a woman. She she plays she plays the seed of the woman, you know, like who you think of as of as a, a man, and then she does the the um the her, hero's job and everything, and she's um she's one of the the enemy clans or whatever, you know, or the rival brothers, you know. So yeah, it's it's um, scripture has a way of like always bringing into into um, the story, people the, who you just the, the underdog, yeah, yeah. 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 G <laughs> right, woman at the well. Yeah, woman at the well. The, the Can Canaanite woman. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is that Jesus comes and then he just um, he. He takes that and he blows it completely up, um, and um, and even goes so far as to say, "Who are my my mother and my brothers and fathers or whatever?" It's 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 whoever's um, yeah exactly yeah, and and him saying that's really taboo at the time because even in our church today we 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 have sayings like family first, right? And he's just gone. Well, my family is not even that family. My family is you guys because you're doing the will of the Father, right? Um, and the, you know, people would have been like, uh, "No, that that's not the way that we think." You know, it's uh, he's really challenging their their um, their way of thinking. Yeah. yeah. So, anybody um, comments, questions, or that was good. So, yeah. Um, 
uh, check out um, the Mountain of Assembly if you missed that. Um, I have a video on it and um, that attaches um, to a lot of things we we're talking about today. And then before that, the, the Magi, the story of the Magi, which I always thought was a fascinating story. And, um, you know, but it, uh, it ties in with the nations. So anybody else? Mark, can I ask a question? Sure. When are you going to post this today? When are you going to post that? Um, this one, I, I usually do it. I kind of get lazy and I, I, I don't know um, wh why. I'm, I mean, I can post it pretty quickly. No, um, because I missed some of the information. I only got like three quarters of it and I want to go back and read it. And oh, I did okay. the, the mountains of assembly and I went over and watched the Magi again while I was recuperating. So oh, okay. it's. Good stuff to do while you're recuperating. Yeah. Um, so actually, um, you're, you're just looking for the verses or something, the references that I had today or something. So you know what I thought about this one? So I missed that. What it is is um, sometimes I'm writing so fast. I'm trying to listen okay. to you and I'm writing and I'm writing. Oh, OK. And, so and rehear it. and not focus so much on trying to get all the information, but to, to, you know what I mean? It's like when you watch a movie a couple of times, oh, I missed that the first time. You know right, what I mean? Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I'll try to, um, um, I'll try to post it a little quicker than I have been. Well, no pressure. I to the story of the Magi. I'm sorry, Angie. I mean, um, I to the story of the Magi. The story of the Magi. How, how do I go there? Oh, um, it's on YouTube. Just look for, um, um, and, and I've been um, posting a link every week on, um, on the text. Okay. So if you okay. go back in, in, a, in, the, in your text record um, for this, for the group that I, um, you'll find a link that I have to the Magi. Um, but I, I actually started a Mark Decock um, channel um, I saw it. Subscribed. What did she say? I'm sorry. I said I saw it and I sur I subscribed. Okay. Did you get it? What I said? No, you you saw it and you subscribed on the channel. Oh, okay, you subscribed. Okay, <laughs> you broke you broke up a little bit there. Okay, sorry. cool. Yeah. I thought she said I saw it and I cried. I know. I was going to cry. I was like, I don't know why you would cry. <laughs> I cry during Bible studies. Yes. Uh, I, I don't have many tearjerker type okay. Bible studies. It's okay if you subscribe or if you cry. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of like, I'll, I'll let the, uh, I like the, let pastors do the uh, um, tearjerker slash inspirational stuff. I Me, mean, I'm kind of like, oh, the story you know the information <laughs> so he's trying to mark has only cried twice in my life <laughs> mm. what? <laughs> since i've known you oh really okay <laughs> so you uh, uh, that's kind of hard to believe i can you name know. them <laughs> okay <laughs> right on the spot I, I got for Clemp during a good movie scene or something, you know. Oh, okay. You have cried more than twice. You know, like not, not like you know, sad crying, but like you know that show more. Home Makeover they used to do. Oh yeah. Extreme Home <laughs> Makeover. Every single week, Mark would cry. I'm like, oh. I'm man. pretty sure. So I started figuring out how fake it was, but. Actually, it's very fake. It's television. We knew somebody who. <laughs> well, all those people lose their homes later. Falls apart. <laughs> okay. Well. You don't need to put this on me. Oh, she doesn't want to be on camera. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you guys uh, later then. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. See you next week. See you next week.